being this, uh, being a Swiss organization, after all, let's start this press conference on time. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, both here in the room, uh, and for those of you who are watching on the live stream, welcome as well. And of course, a very warm welcome uh, to to the panelists today. Um, you're joining the press conference on China's top 50 AI companies that are reshaping the economy. We'll hear uh, uh, much more about that in a second, but uh, I won't give up the privilege of introducing our wonderful uh, panelists today. So to my immediate left and right in the heart and center of our panel today, I'm joined by Nina Xiang. She's the managing editor of the China Money Network uh, based in, in Hong Kong. and. Uh, on her other side, we're joined by Professor Stuart Russell. He's a professor of computer science at the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the title of the press conference already gives away what we're going to talk about. Um, and we are uh, in a good place for that because over the last day or day and a half, we've heard a lot already about artificial intelligence. We also heard that artificial intelligence is probably one of the technologies where China is uh, uh, blazing ahead uh, in comparison to, uh, to other countries. So I think it's very timely and very interesting to hear both from you. Uh, Nina, tell us a little bit about these 50 companies you've chosen as the, as the top uh, uh, 50 AI companies in China and how they're going to influence the economy. Please, mm -hmm. floor is yours. <clears throat> uh, thank you, George, for that. Hi, uh, everyone. My name is Nina Xiang. I'm the founder and managing editor of China Money Network. What we do at China Money Network is uh, every day we track what's happening in the Chinese venture capital and technology sector, and we bring that news, intelligence, and data to our international readers and um, uh, followers. So naturally, AI has been one of the most active, high profile, and significant sectors uh, we have witnessed for, for the past few years. As a place where top VCs are making tens of billions of dollars into, um, as, a as a place where top talents are migrating to, and also um, uh, as uh, an increasing, rising technology penetrating and changing almost every sector in the Chinese economy. So uh, just a little bit background on why we did this today, because last year, in 2017, we released China AI Top 10. That really provided some real insights into the superstars in the Chinese AI space. So this year, we're really proud to announce the China AI Top 50 um, during the Summer Davos Conference right here in Tianjin. So before I go ahead and just give a very brief introduction of how we produce this ranking and also the methodology we used, um, if you're here, uh, you have some print material, you can see the QR code. Uh, if you use your phone, uh, to scan the QR code, you'll be able to access uh, the real report. So that might be a very helpful uh, background reading for, uh, for you as I explain the methodology. So just very briefly, how we made this uh, ranking is, firstly, we collected data um, uh, via two ways. First, we asked companies to submit their data to us. So this way, we collected hundreds of company data directly from the company themselves. And then we combined and consolidated all this data with our own existing data bank. We ended up about uh, with 1,122 companies uh, under consideration for this ranking. Then we used the evaluation, uh, weighted evaluation system to give each company a score. Uh, we considered about 12 different items across five areas. Um, just very briefly, the five areas include uh, their technology capability, the maturity of their products, fundraising, business fundamentals, and future potential. So this way, we give each company a score. And according to the score, we came out with three rankings, the China AI Top 10, China AI Top 20, and China AI Top 50. So just a reminder, the top 10 companies are not compared with each other um, you know, as number one to number 10. They're equal in the ranking. That's because of some, some limitations, which we explain in the full report. So uh, we have the three lists that give you really a, a flavor of who are the super top level 
level star companies in the Chinese AI space. So what we have found is very interesting. Just very briefly to share you with uh, some highlights. Uh, of, uh, uh, of the findings. So I guess nobody here would ever imagine there are actually 14 unicorns in the Chinese AI space. 14. So I think people don't even, you know, can, can name 14 Chinese AI companies, but 14 companies are valued at $1 billion or more. And combined, they're together worth about 40.5 billion US dollars. That's very, very significant in terms of how this really new and emerging uh, and, and pretty much in infancy industry is growing rapidly. Uh, another fact is, out of the 50 companies, only two companies had female founders. I think that's an area I've talked to a lot of people who feel that we should definitely do something about this, try to encourage our female entrepreneurs to, um, uh, to, 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 to brave into the startup world and uh, build something that can change the world. And uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, 27 of the 50 companies are backed by Chinese government or and uh, the ABAT. So the government capital is actively participating and investing into the Chinese AI space. And of course, the Chinese traditional technology giants are influencing and shaping the industry's future as well. 55.6% um, of the founders have doctoral or postdoctoral degrees, and over 73% have master degrees or above. So this is a very, um, uh, it's a very knowledge-based and expertise-based sector. So this is, this comes as uh, expected. Um, so I guess I want to leave more time for uh, Q&A later. I think that would be more interesting. Uh, for any other details, you can definitely uh, read the full report. We have about 50 pages of company <laughs> profiles where we give each company uh, a brief introduction of their history, why, we, um, why this company is interesting or significant. And, and I think reading through those will really give you a flavor of how this industry uh, is growing and what the companies are doing on the company level. So uh, with that, maybe I'll, I'll pass Thank back to George. Thank you, Nina. And, and let me jump over to you, Professor Russell. So you're based, you're based in Berkeley, at the University of Berkeley. You're based in California. Yeah. When are you, hearing all that, when are you moving to China? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I feel like I'm, I'm sort of moving to China anyway because I'm here so often. Uh, I think this is my fifth visit to China this year. Um, and I always enjoy coming here. It's an incredibly vibrant uh, ecosystem. They, um, the AI companies are very varied. And I think the main thing that they benefit from is the size of the online economy in China, which is enormous, actually much bigger than the online economy in the US. And, uh, and that provides a playground for AI systems. Um, you know, the real world, uh, as opposed to the online world, the real world is actually quite tough for AI systems. And you've got to build robots. They have to see. They have to grasp. They have to touch. And that's, uh, that's all quite difficult, uh, technologically speaking. But in the online world, you can be a successful AI system with a with no eyes and no hands. Mm. Um, and this has created incredible opportunities. But one thing I see actually um, maybe differentiating the, the Chinese and the US um, AI venture capital space is that there's much more focus uh, in China on the technological capability, whether it's speech recognition, accuracy, or face recognition, machine translation, um, and a, a bit less focus on the business model. So in the, in the US, it's can you come up with a business model, some way to, to use AI to make money um, without so much focus on, you know, is the AI technology itself uh, really of the highest quality? Um, and I think in some areas, speech recognition uh, and face recognition in particular, China has pulled ahead a little bit of the US uh, in terms of quality. Um, but I think there are, you know, the. The real world robotics areas are going to be, uh, this is the next big battleground. Um, in, the, in the online space, I think you can coexist. Uh, Chinese companies and US companies and European companies can coexist because the online world is in some sense infinitely large. Mm. But uh, in, in the real world, 
the first companies to have really successful self-driving cars are going to dominate uh, that industry. The first companies to build really successful uh, domestic robots that are agile, that are dexterous, that are sufficiently intelligent to function in the household, uh, they're going to dominate that space. And um, in these areas, it, really significant engineering effort is required. Particularly with domestic robots, it's a sort of a chicken and egg problem, mm. right? To, to create a, a physical robot that's agile and dexterous and has high quality perception, uh, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of investment uh, in the manufacturing capability and, and the engineering of those devices. And it's useless because we don't have the AI systems to run it. So it's going to sit there in the corner, you know, getting rusty. Uh, and at the same time, we, we, we have a hard time building the AI systems to run uh, domestic robots because we don't have any really good robots. You know, I have a, I have a robot in our lab. It cost us $400,000. Um, and it doesn't even have hands, right? It sort of has grippers like this, but no fingers. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot of stuff it can do in the household. Um, yeah. So if whoever breaks that chicken and egg cycle um, is going to win really big because now you can then you can put robots out in construction and agriculture and domestic situations, elder care, health care, uh, you name it. And that's going to be a huge wave of value for the human race. Thank you, Professor. I've let me follow up on one thing you just mentioned, that you said the, the, was the focus in the US is very much on the business model. In China, it's really on the technological angle. Um, is, uh, in your opinion, and, and you know, feel free to chime in, is that a fact of the strong role of government in financing uh, AI companies here? And do you think that will stifle their chances on the global market once they move out of that, out of that space? Uh, it could be that. Um, it could just be that. I think for a long time in the US, the company formation has been led more by MBAs than by PhDs. Um, and, uh, and I think in China, it's more, more of an engineering dominated culture, um, you know, all, even all the way up to the top levels of the government, that's yeah. true. Uh, so I think there's a bit more respect for the quality of the technology uh, as opposed to just, can I, can I find some way to make money out of it? <laughs> Actually, yeah, yeah I, um, I do feel at least, you know, for the 50 companies who are in the ranking, they actually have a keen focus on commercialization. Mm -hmm. um, and they have actually progressed significantly on the road of commercialization. So that means some AI, com you know, most of these AI companies on the ranking, they have already have mature products and services that enterprises or consumers can buy, can use as technology solutions. Some companies have already uh, secured significant revenue and revenue growth. And some companies you know, are even predicting they will be making profits as an AI company. So that is quite amazing. And I think, I think in China, actually, the focus is about application. Um, it's less about fundamental core technology research, but it's really about how do you use this technology in real business uh, scenarios, in real industry verticals, and how do you actually produce products that can create very concrete uh, efficiency improvements or cost cutting for businesses, and this has been, you know, this is happening uh, really if we talk about how these companies are changing the Chinese economy, this is how they're changing the Chinese economy by incorporating all these technology capabilities so that companies are saving costs, they're improving their efficiency. Um, and, uh, and, and I would say, you know, we do witness this strong focus um, um, on commercialization. Um, perhaps you know some companies are still a little bit lagged behind, but the industry as a whole are quite advanced in, in that respect, I think. Mm -hmm. um, before I open uh, the floor for questions, um, uh, the professor mentioned some, some areas where the AI uh, uh, technology will be applied. Uh, you mentioned agriculture, you mentioned health and others. Um, from the, let's say, focus on the top 10 list, what do you see there? Or, or maybe go to the top 20. Do you see a concentration in a certain area or a focus on a certain industry uh, in, yes, your, in your list? Yes, certainly, certainly, yes. So we, we look at them by two 
pro uh, aspects. One is the technology area of the focus, uh, or they, they utilize to, to make their products and services. Another is the industry vertical, they apply the technology. So overwhelmingly, we see these companies are centered around um, what we call uh, uh, you know, the, the senses. So letting machines see, so computer vision. Uh, voice recognition, so letting uh, machines to be able to hear and speak, and, uh, and also natural language processing. So if we, we also did an analysis on the whole industry and we see over 80% of the companies are focused on computer vision, voice recognition, natural language processing. So these are very basic functions this industry is trying to add uh, or help machine to see and hear and understand mind-machine interaction, this process. So definitely that's a focus in terms of technology. In terms of industry, for the top 50 companies, the top, top industry is public security. So in China, what does that mean? That means, um, that means uh, uh, public security police department big data platforms. Uh, that means uh, office building public space uh, public security uh, insurance uh, in, or um, uh, systems. So that means uh, train stations, surveillance cameras, how do you process the video content and simultaneously recognize people, objects, vehicles, um, accidents, um, uh, violations of traffic rules. Uh, so this is really a big sector in China, public security. Uh, that's a top sector we find for the top 50 companies. Um, the other very active sectors include um, uh, uh, financial services, of course, is another big sector, and also education and healthcare. Um, uh, AI chips, as we all know, recently has been very uh, much a hot topic in China. China has no, uh, has very little um, capability to produce their own chips, especially AI chips, and this is an area that we have seen recently in the past few months, a lot of companies are getting into. But we, for the industry as a whole, only 3% of the AI companies are engaged in a, a chip uh, design or chip manufacturing. So this is a place we see in the future definitely will be uh, witnessing a lot of uh, rapid growth. Mm. Uh, Professor, when the, when the forum uh, started 12 years ago, a science and technology meeting in China, a lot of people in Europe and the US were asking, why do you do a technology meeting in China? I think they understand that very much today, and the, mm -hmm. the press conference is another, another proof point. Uh, when you talk to AI, uh, your fellow AI experts, and um, also a lot of people in the, in the industry in the US, are they aware of how advanced China is in that field already, or are they... Are they missing uh, what's actually happening? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if, uh, if you go to any major conference, um, you will see uh, a very large fraction of the papers are coming from China these days. So, so everyone is very, very much aware of this. I would say it's still the case that the, the major conceptual breakthroughs are coming from primarily the US academic sector. Mm. Um, but I, it, it seems inevitable that that also will shift. Um, yeah as time goes forward. Yeah. Uh, so, so China's been um, very fortunate in that, that it's, it's able to attract very large numbers of students into these technical areas, uh, partly because it has very good mathematics education, mm. uh, which is an essential prerequisite. So for all you students out there, take more math courses before <laughs> if you want to get into AI. Um, and, uh, and so inevitably, uh, as long as the university sector in China uh, is well maintained mm. uh, and we prevent a brain drain out of the academic sector uh, into industry, then I think we'll see uh, big basic research breakthroughs happening in China. Uh, and those benefit everyone, of course. I just want to add that actually companies in China are also realizing they need to strengthen research and development uh, spending or investment to ensure that in the long term they can, they're able to um, remain competitive. So they realize that they cannot build a sustainable long-term business without keep investing into fundamental R&D. So we see that you know, that's happening among the 50 companies today uh, on the ranking for sure.
So let's come back next year and check the list and see which of the 50 are still in next, next year. Next year we may have to do 100 don't, companies. 100 companies. Okay. <laughs> yeah. now, I've been very selfishly asking all the questions myself. We have members of the media in the room who are, of course, keen to ask questions uh, of their own. Please, uh, if you could identify yourself um, and name your, uh, your name and organization. We have microphones here, especially for the sake of our online audience. Please, the gentleman in the front. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Daisuke Fruta from BuzzFeed Japan. Um, I have a question about the playground for AI system. Um, yeah, AI system uh, needs data to learn by itself. Um, and China is known for uh, the, about the, the protection of personal information. China is not so strong than other countries. So is it a strong point for, uh, of China for AI companies? Because they can use data. Really? Um, so that's a very interesting question. And, and I, I just spent a year living in France where uh, the, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations, are a very big issue for the AI industry. Um, and uh, I think at the moment, yes, I would say uh, Chinese companies probably have access to more data, uh, not just for more people. And I think that's it. That's probably a, something where people get confused. It's not how many people you have in your database, it's how much data you have about each person uh, that matters most. And, um, but I think what's happening in, in the technology space is that we're developing ways of doing machine learning uh, using completely encrypted data, meaning that your data remains totally private, but it can still contribute to running a machine learning algorithms that produce uh, voice recognition or, or machine translation systems or whatever it might be. So you can have the best of both worlds. You can have complete privacy and uh, total ability to create machine learning data from very large data sets. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to add uh, for the companies that we actually talked to, because this time we did talk to dozens of companies um, across Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, uh, and elsewhere. And when we were talking with them, of course, this is a question we asked them as well. A lot of companies are taking actions to protect user privacy. For example, um, for healthcare company, uh, or AI company trying to apply AI technology in healthcare, in medical imaging, so they need large amount of data, for example, uh, lung cancer. So they need perhaps a large data set of the medical image of lung cancer, and they need to access the data from hospitals. So they will be working with perhaps dozens of hospitals across China. They get that data from the hospitals through a partnership. However, they do protect individual patients' privacy by taking out the individual patient's identification. So you wouldn't know who this patient is. You wouldn't know its name. You wouldn't know its, perhaps you need to keep some other um, metrics to, to, uh, in order to um, contribute to how um, uh, the medical imaging is corresponding to perhaps the age and the, the, the sex, whatever. So, so they are taking actions to protect user uh, privacy. And a lot of these companies are actually engaging um, very constructive dialogue with government agencies. They all tell us that they, they talk to the government agencies, they actively try to engage with conversation about how to set up standards to protect user privacy and also to ensure data security. So we do see some encouraging signs from the industry that the companies are doing things to ensure that um, we do have privacy and we have data security. Thank you, Nina. Do we, yes, there's a lady with a question there. Please identify yourself. And uh, I'm from New Finance Observatory. My question is, there are 14 AI unicorns in China. That's a very big number. So is there a possibility they are overvalued? Thank you. Yes, so we did ask a lot of companies or experts we talked to, and we asked them to use three words to describe the Chinese AI industry right now. And the most frequently used words, hot, crazy, overvalued. So for sure, definitely, 
everybody who's in the industry, who work in the company themselves, and everybody who's um, an expert, academia um, of the industry or observer, they do agree that there is a certain overheated um, atmosphere in the current AI space for sure. And a lot of people expect in the next um, near term, we will definitely see a correction. So that means a reduction of uh, the number of AI companies out there. Uh, the ones who doesn't make sense, doesn't have the core technology capabilities will perhaps disappear. And we'll also see the valuation perhaps having, um, uh, having to dial back a little bit because a lot of companies are able to, you know, they are able to raise fundraising at valuation that often double in the matter of a few months. And that, as we know, is, is a sure sign of uh, uh, over-optimism, perhaps. So definitely, um, there is a consensus on, on the overheatedness of the industry, for sure. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Otherwise, I'll use the opportunity to, to ask a question. Um, so you mentioned that AI is heavily developed and beginning to be used, especially in, for security and safety. Um, now, I come from Germany, where you have literally kind of the term German angst. Germans are always a bit afraid of new technologies. Do you imagine that you'll see something similar in China, that you see a backlash against the technology because it is used in particular for safety and security in, in that particular space? Professor? Putting you on the spot a little bit here, but uh, let's, uh, let's Well, I, I, I can't really speak for China. I could sort of speak for the, the world in, in general. I think that there is a legitimate concern, uh, actually, at several levels. Um, there's very real concern about the use of AI uh, for weapons. Um, and I think uh, that concern is very justified. Um, and I'm very happy that China has actually supported uh, an international treaty banning autonomous weapons. Um, I, I think that there could also be a backlash against AI systems used both for surveillance and uh, what we might call persuasion technology. So increasingly, it's possible to, to customize the information flow to an individual uh, in order to modify their behavior. Uh, and it might actually be uh, almost accidental, right? You might simply want to modify the behavior so that they spend more money or they click on ads more often. Uh, but you may find that in the process of doing that, you're actually creating a monster. You're you, know, you're, you find you, you will end up feeding that person false information, inflammatory propaganda articles, uh, and, uh, and then creating a monster in the process. So, so this surveillance and persuasion industry, I think, needs to look very carefully at their own ethical standards. Uh, and, and I believe that we will start to see regulation to protect people. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is a really important thing. Even something as simple as a, a law that says that any machine that's communicating with me has to identify itself as a machine. Mm so that I know that I'm dealing with a machine and not a person. Uh, that would be a, a simple step. I think we could pretty much all agree to that, uh, but that would be an important step. I just want to share, um, thank you, Professor Russell. Uh, that's very interesting. What uh, we see uh, um, during our visits to our companies, a very interesting thing is we're visiting a facial recognition company, and they have a camera right at the entrance of the company's uh, lobby. So that means everybody who's entering uh, the building will, be, will have their face scanned. And if you work in the company, your name and your number will appear on the big screen um, above, uh, um, above the, the, the lobby uh, wall. So interestingly, we see some, some employee who enter the building purposefully uh, cover their face. So they cover the face so that the camera wouldn't capture their face, wouldn't scan their face, and wouldn't have their uh, name and um, other information display on the computer screen. So I think as this technology become more prevalent and people will realize that they, they want to protect their privacy, and I think this kind of feedback from the public uh, will push the government and regulators to, to take action. Um, so, so I'm overall optimistic. I think um, you know, the, uh, 
people and users and the public will be able to push uh, for protective measures. Thank you very much. Perfect closing words for this press conference. Again, we started on time. Let's, let's keep that virtue and, and end on time. Thank you very much to Thank both you, of George. you for presenting these interesting uh, insights on artificial intelligence and especially on the role of, of China there. Uh, thank you very much for being in the room here with us today. And uh, also thank you to everyone watching live. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.